Terry's a model for all of us in so many ways, and it's just such a pleasure for me to introduce Terry today. Terry, thank you so much for everything, and I welcome you to the podium. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Burgess, for that intro introduction. Um, and, you know, this is actually, believe it or not, this is our 23rd year of the Global Retail uh, Conference. And that's technically correct, but it's, uh, if, if you really want to know the truth, uh, this, this, uh, this retail conference really got legs about 10 years ago, I would say. And I, I got very involved and started pushing hard and, uh, in terms of who of my friends I could pressure to come to Tucson, Arizona. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and it worked. And, and I think the early ones are the pioneers, and I give them a lot of credit because they sort of spread the word back in New York and other places uh, for others to come and share. And what made this conference from the very beginning uh, different and unique is the, the combination of, of, of wonderful uh, presenters um, and, um, and, and great uh, teams of, of executives in the room who network and, and, and connect with one another and then come back year after year uh, and continue to share ideas about the, the future of retail. And then I think very, very importantly is our integration of students into um, our audience and, and, our, and, and all the participation. And, I, and, and more and more, um, as I come back, that's something I feel very passionate about, uh, is making sure that the students have a voice here, uh, because they are the future of, of retail. And, and not only uh, are these just individuals, just smart young individual students who are here, they're here for a reason. They're, they're interested, passionate about uh, our industry. Uh, so for that, uh, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Each year, uh, you know, about uh, September, October, November, I get um, nervous about uh, this conference <laughs> because I, I say, oh my God, uh, how are we going to beat last year? You know, it's, it's always about beating last year, right? It's, it's, still, it's still about beating last year for, for, for me. And a uh, little, bit, little, little bit different than comp store sales growth, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but not really. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of the same. And so um, um, I, I have that, that pressure uh, on myself about how to make this conference uh, help, help Scott and the team make it better than, than last year. And I can tell you, it's better than last year. <laughs> we have a phenomenal lineup, uh, and we had a phenomenal conference last year, and we've got a phenomenal lineup this year, and I'm already a little freaked out about next year. Uh, so, uh, but we'll, we'll get, let's get through the next couple of days before I... Uh, I worry about that. Finally, just to sort of set up my talk today, I, I, you're, and you're going to hear more numbers uh, from people like you know Sarah and Matt, who will follow me this morning, and Doug McMillan a little bit later, uh, and others about the importance of our industry. But um, you know, just take a moment to reflect on that. That 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 consumption in America represents 70% of GDP. One in four jobs in America are associated with the retail industry. We have $2.6 trillion uh, of, of value to, uh, in contributions to our economy are retail related. So, so our industry is critically important to, to not just jobs, but to the overall health and welfare of of our economy and of the, of the world economy. So it just makes this conference and these conversations uh, more and more important. Uh, so with that, just a little bit more, more set up, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Macy's, uh, Macy's, maybe for the, the final time. I, I actually had invited, uh, last year Jeff Gannett uh, presented, from, uh, who's my successor at Macy's, and, um, and we had Rachel Schechtman, who is the founder of Story, uh, which was acquired by Macy's certainly after that. She, pre she presented, uh, and I had Hal Lawton, who is the new, relatively new, a couple years now, uh, president of uh, uh, Macy's scheduled to come, uh, come speak. And then there all of a sudden became a, a conflict this, uh, this, this, this week, and, and, I, and he found out about it and ended up having to scramble. Uh, so I've got Hal on the hook for next year, but since he's not here, 
uh, this year, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, about Macy's. And so, so just first of all, some of the things that you know, took place, and many of you already, already know this, but some of the things that helped the good days, and I'm going to get to the challenging parts, the good days in the, in the really super strong periods of time of growth uh, was obviously creating the first you know, national fashion uh, brand with all of the design brand names uh, on, a, on a national scale, the creation of My Macy's, localization of inventory uh, in, by, by store, by market, um, very quick and early on to e-commerce, creating uh, the fourth largest uh, online retailer in the country, um, pushing a ton of the capital toward not just technology uh, and, and online, but, but toward mobile first, recognizing early that everything was going to move to your phone. And, 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 and so just you know, all these various investments, even, even in social media, recognizing that you know, I was a little bit concerned about it early on, you know, 15 years ago, about social media and what that would mean. And over time, I was convinced by my team, look, people are going to be talking about us. Why not join that conversation? Why not lead that conversation? And so having a different mindset, I think, early uh, about, about social media was, was very helpful. Uh, and, you know, and so there, that, then that period of time uh, that I had my tenure as CEO and chairman was, you know, lots of good, lots of good results, which we were very, very proud of. Um, but then I put this slide up here because uh, this, you know, sort of is a great little uh, painting that um, is in, uh, in our home in, uh, in New York City. Uh, this is just part of it. I'll show you the rest in a minute. Uh, but this is uh, kind of tells you, like, the experience, you know, that I was feeling back with all those numbers I showed you and the organization was feeling very good and, and li I was life on the beach, you know, sand rolling in. I got no, no care in the world. Life is good. Uh, everything looks pretty fantastic through 2015. And then there's a bigger picture, you know, <laughs> of what's really going on. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and this is the actual photograph, and I have that or photograph, the actual painting in my home, and Tina's in my home. And we, we, uh, we actually, there, there's a, this is, is such relevance to me in, in my own, own life, is that you just can't relax in the retail business. You can never take for granted that what happened last year, what happened last week is going to continue uh, I I onward, uh, if, by the way, positive or, or negative. You have to recognize that right behind the calm, there's always some uh, tsunami just uh, sort of waiting uh, to take you out if you're, uh, if you're not on your game and if you're not prepared, if you're not thinking, thinking forward. So I've kind of broken this down uh, into what I call a history of disruptions. And, um, and I go back and, and look back in the 80s, in the late 80s, and I, this is when I was in my, uh, my first CEO job. I was 35, I was the CEO of Bullock's Wilshire, and I thought I was going to retire from there 30 years later. I was happy as could, could, could be, and my company got taken over by Campo. There was no reason why, that, why Campo should have been allowed to take over federated department stores. Uh, ex there's only one reason, and that was money was free and flowing from the banks, and, and we were very happy to leverage up all these retailers uh, because they had strong cash flow. Well, they had strong cash flow until they didn't. And, 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 and all of a sudden, when they were highly leveraged, they were extremely vulnerable to bankruptcy. And my own company, which was a very healthy, fit, strong federated department stores with many, the, many uh, great named department store brands, including Bloomingdale's and Bullock's and many others, uh, went from healthy earnings, consistent earnings, to bankrupt in one year. Uh, and that wasn't just that wasn't just uh, that wasn't just federated departments. There's many many others that went through through this whole thing. Bonwit, Tellers, B Altman's, all of these companies either went out of business or went 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 bankrupt. Uh, Macy's actually went bankrupt shortly after that period. And so that was what I call the the era of leveraged uh, era of leverage. And then and then uh, 94 95 um, that became the era of consolidation. And that's when I went back. To, I was at Neiman Marcus for, for the six years prior, but I went back to um, Federated Department Stores with the idea that we would buy Macy's because that was when there was roll-ups beginning to take place. The only reason that those roll-ups were happening, the consolidation was happening, was because many of those, those 
uh, poor balance sheet companies were financially weak and they were vulnerable to being taken over, but that consolidation was actually helpful to get supply and demand back in line for the industry, and then there was a period of growth after that area of consolidation. The strong survived and grew, the, the, the weak became, were absorbed or, or went away. And then there was uh, what I call the dot-gone era. So the, the dot-com, you know, was, uh, businesses were exploding in the mid to late 90s, and I remember it very vividly, just the, the, the young 20-something-year-olds walking around, you know, with, on their, uh, on, uh, with all of their, their, their devices making speeches and, you know, about their amazing company that they have, and, and now they're going to be worth a billion dollars shortly. And, and, and uh, the reality was is that Wall Street woke up in 2000 and 2001. By Wall Street, I mean all investors. All investors woke up and said, most of these companies, most of these online businesses are a flash in the pan. They have no possible way to make money over the long term. So therefore, I'm going to stop funding them right now. And that happened almost overnight in the year 2000. And you went from 10,000 of these uh, startups uh, to, a, to a huge contraction because the funding dried up. You had to have a business model that made sense. And that's when companies like Facebook and Google and others grew, grew very significantly during, the, during that area because they, in fact, did have such a, a business model. So that dot gone era was, again, an area of, uh, of things shrinking down and supply and demand coming back in line once again. And then, uh, of course, uh, at the end of 2001, and those of you retailers who have been around that long uh, can say and know that 2001 spring, before 9-11 occurred, uh, the economy was very weak. Retail consumption was very weak during that period. So we could feel a, a recession coming on before it was announced that there was going to be a recession. Well, of course, no one anticipated 9-11 and what happened then, uh, but, of but it was an immediate uh, response from consumers who simply stopped shopping on that afternoon. On September 11, Monday, September 11th, 2001, consumers stopped shopping and, 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 and started to reflect on what's important in their life. And it was not a new sweater, it was not a new pair of shoes, but it was my family. Uh, it, was, it was thinking about my future and it was thinking about very different things. Uh, so business stopped. Again, one, once again, and after each of these periods, there was growth again in retail. There was, there was uh, solid growth in performance in general. Until, of course, the, the, the next uh, era, uh, which was the, the, the financial crisis in 08 and 09, which I've labeled as the, the era of mistrust. Because here, you had families who always believed that their household was, was their nest egg for their future that they could always count on that. Uh, but when suddenly their mortgage uh, had, had more paper attached to it than the actual value of the house, uh, they, they, they mistrusted that dream. And they mis mistrusted the financial institutions for, for, for even loaning them the money that they couldn't afford to repay during, those, uh, during a pullback in the economy. They, re they, they mistrusted companies who ended up having to lay off people when consumers stopped shopping. And the ripple effect, as I said, of the retail business is so large, when consumers stopped shopping, it impacted so many. And so I call this, this, area, era, that, uh, this era of mistrust. And then we get to... Uh, uh, what happened in, in, uh, in the last, uh, last couple of years. And, and, I, and I'm going to talk about that. This is what I'm going to talk about for uh, today. And I call this the, the, the era of, of, of imbalance. And, uh, and it's uh, very clear uh, to me uh, what's happening. I think it's clear to me what's happening. Um, but um, the, the effect has been more gradual. It wasn't like they stopped shopping uh, on September 11th, 2001. It wasn't like what happened in 2008 and 2009 when, when Lehman Brothers collapsed and, and, and Merrill Lynch was, was, was absorbed and, and, and all this was taking place instantly and quickly and, 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 and in a very scary way. It wasn't like that. It's been much more gradual in this last, uh, this last period. But I believe there's a reason, uh, a couple of them, uh, for this, this, this gradual uh, but very impactful change on, uh, the, on the retail industry. So uh, here we go. So, so uh, and I'm going to talk now about responding, uh, responding to uh, these, uh, the, the, these, these challenges. 
Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, um, um, but, um, but I'm gonna I'm, I am going to cover a number of different things, including supply and demand, uh, physical retail supply, inventory that's in those physical uh, retail uh, locations. Um, but uh, I want to give a little perspective uh, first before I, before I do that about uh, the impact of online shopping, because obviously, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of growth in online, online shopping, so that has to come out of somewhere, right? You know, all this growth, they, they mean that the entire market of retail hasn't grown by, by this much, so therefore some portion of this uh, online growth has to come out of physical retail. It just has to. And so, so uh, this looks like a very impressive sh chart, right? Well, you can't really see all the numbers very clearly, but let me now put it into perspective against physical retail shopping and online shopping. There's the reality. Now, it, it has definitely uh, taken down physical retail shopping uh, in, in terms of total dollars and total percent to, to, to a percent to total um, retail sales, but it's still 90% or 89.5% as Sarah and I were talking, uh, uh, talking earlier. So the large, 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 large majority still of everything you buy uh, is still bought in a physical store. It's still, it, it, it may be bought online and picked up in a physical store, or it may be shipped from a physical store, but the physical store itself is where the majority of the activity is. You can see those curves are, are, should get our attention, but it's gonna be a long time before we say we no longer need any physical stores. It's gonna be a long time before that. Having said that, there are too many. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So part of the reason is that there is, there, there is too many is because of the fact that our buying habits have changed. Our behavior has changed. Meaning, when I say our, I'm talking about when I was in the age 20 to 30s, in 20s to 30s, the age of today's uh, millennial, and then the, the generation, the, y, the Z behind them, uh, how they are spending money today is very different than how my generation was spending money when we were at, at, at those ages. So, you know, we had, we were, we were uh, first of all, when, in, when we were at those, those, uh, those ages, we were uh, married, we were shopping for, in department stores, um, we wore a tie to, uh, to work, uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we did many things uh, that are not necessarily being done today, and of course there was no internet shopping uh, back then. And so today, uh, the millennials are, sh are sh definitely shopping online, they're shopping off-price, which isn't uh, widely talked about, but the growth of the off-price business has de been directly related to consumer shopping behavior changes. So when you think about online, the, the piece of the business is overall has been taken away uh, due to online shopping, you have to also consider how off-price has been such a, a big and growing segment of shopping that that's taken a piece away from traditional uh, retail, at retail as well. And so, so and, and, and I call that the good enough syndrome, you know, the, that, that the product is good enough and therefore I'm, I'm prepared to go into an off, buy it off price either buy it on sale in a, in, a, in a department store or buy it in an off-price environment because the product is, is good enough. And I think that's a consumer behavioral change from this generation uh, that has been very impactful on, on their spending. And then another very big one, besides the fact that, that, that more of the, the money of this generation is going to vacations and to musics and to, and to experiences, is the fact that they're spending $150 to $300 a month on their phone and on services and on Netflix and on you know, all these various types of, uh, of downloads, which is obviously huge. It's a huge amount of their open to spend going to other places instead of buying uh, uh, shirts and ties and, and shoes and other things that our generation, my generation, once bought when they were this age. So we all need to put that uh, in, into perspective. Who is our target customer? What are they doing in terms of their spending habits? And how am I going to put that customer at the center of all of my decisions, the center of my buying decisions, the center of my service and, and selling decisions? How am I going to put that customer at the center of those decisions when I'm making those decisions? 
And if we're going to expect them uh, to be loyal to us, you know, we're going to have to think about some, some other things, too. Uh, and that is, and I spent a lot of time on campus uh, this week, in addition to the five-day class I taught last fall, which, by the way, you can only do that when you're retired. You can't really do that <laughs> as a full-time CEO. But, but, uh, uh, but I spent a lot of time on campus this week as well, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, full-time in, in classrooms. And, and, and when I'm listening to these students, a lot of the feedback is, uh, coming back right at me, and I saw this at my own former company uh, for the last particularly five or six years. They want to know, are you a good corporate citizen? They want to know, what are you doing for the environment? They want to know, what are you doing for climate? They want to know, are, are you really thinking about the sustainability of the product sourcing work that you're doing in your company? And I said to the, these young students, I said, that is is more important today, I hear it loud and clear, I heard it from my, uh, my own former employees, more important today than it's ever been, it's still third. Number one is the product have to, has to be right, because you can have the most fantastic sustainability program in the world, if you don't have the product that that young consumer wants, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters, but it's not gonna drive them to buy something that they don't want or need. Second is price. They're gonna always make sure that your value is, is a respectable value, you've, you've thought about it, and it's the total value. It's not just the, the product price, it's how you service that, that product, how, 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 what kind of experience you had buying that product, the environment that, the, that you, you felt when you were inside that, that, that physical store or online, all of those things add to the overall value. That's right behind the product itself, and then, risen to that third, third, uh, third spot is in, in, in buying decisions is now, what are you doing uh, to become a good uh, corporate citizen of the world and, and giving back and, and making sure that you, uh, you embrace the, the sustainability values that I, as a young consumer, em embrace. So, so all of these things are, uh, are becoming more and more important for us all to understand as we try to replace the purchasing of the former baby boomers with these, uh, the, the, these, this new generation of consumers. And so here, you know, I just simply uh, am, am pointing out that um, there is a, um, a clear message that's been, been, been told to me, and that is uh, that we've, we've, we've over, overbuilt the, the physical um, retail space uh, requirements and demand of the consumer. So we've not just caught up, we've sur surpassed it. And um, I think I've got a slide here to talk about very specifically what I mean. And this is the retail square footage per capita. So per human being in the United States, there are 23.5 square feet of retail space that you, as a one single person, can shop from. Look at the rest of these numbers around the world. Um, and you know you can make the argument that Canada and Australia are over over uh, space too. Uh, in fact, I just get, gave a speech in Aus to the Aust Australian Retail um, Association in Sydney just a couple of weeks ago about this very subject because they're curious uh, about this this subject as well. Uh, you know, and and I should also point out that America should have more square footage. We should have more square footage devoted to retail because we spend more, we buy more, we consume more than any other country at per capita, but not five times more than the United Kingdom. So we're, we're a little out of whack here. Now, there are stores that are opening. There are new concepts that are opening. You're going to hear from some of them over the next, next uh, two days. So don't let me make you think that this is an all-in conversation. It's not. But I can tell you very clearly that square footage in the United States devoted to retail needs to shrink. And it's going to. And you're already seeing it. This is, uh, this is something that's happening uh, in, in, in multiple places uh, around the country already. Uh, I think uh, Signet is the, uh, the, the big jewelry retailer announced yesterday they're closing uh, 100 and some odd stores uh, because uh, they're doing the same thing. And over the last couple of years, they've now closed 13% of their stores. As hard as that is to close an individual stores, this is going to be good for companies like that because they're doing exactly what I'm talking about is they're getting their own physical supply and demand back in line again. Uh, Macy's closed, uh, announced closing 20% of their stores just a couple of years ago. I think that was the right number. I think you have to keep thinking about 
you know, what is it that, that, that we're doing? And I, and I also was on CNBC this morning, and, I, and they were saying, is this everybody? And I said, no, it's not everybody. I said, because in the luxury sector, even though they've had their own bumps along the way, their supply and demand is actually in line for the most part. There's not too many Louis Vuitton uh, outlets out there today. Uh, th Bloomingdale's has 38 stores. That's not too many physical uh, retail stores. Uh, Saks just announced their, their, for that one division of Hudson Bay Group, that's their best performing by far division. They, so they're, they've get that, got supply and demand in pretty good uh, sh shape with some 40 some odd stores. So it's not across the board, but in total, it definitely has to, has to come back. And that's why you're seeing Signet and Macy's and Gap and Sears and, and many, many others uh, beginning to contract their, their square footage. It just has to happen. Um, and so, you know, Here's what happens, it's, and when I talk about physical retail, of course I'm talking about physical buildings and space, but the real problem for us is what's in the, that physical space. It's the inventory. It's a, it, that's where the buildup creates uh, oversupply and, 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 and has a whole bunch of ripple effects, which I will get to, uh, that cause the real problems uh, for, for retailers uh, going forward. So here's the reality of the, of, of, of the picture. Uh, the changing consumer buying habits I've described. There's increased demand for online. There's declining in-store sales overall. Again, variations by company and by product category that's underserved. Uh, and uh, there's been the adoption of off-price, which has been a big one in terms of taking share away from consumers' pocketbooks. And, uh, and oversupply of stores and, and, and retail uh, space. So with all of that information, you know, raise your hand if you think we should be closing more stores. Okay, and so now raise your hand if you think there, uh, you should be opening stores. 50-50. <laughs> and uh, you know what? You're both right. Uh, I mean, I'm, you're both exactly right because of just, uh, just what I said. You know, certain businesses need to, to, to shrink other businesses can still, uh, still grow, but at the end of the day, there needs to be you know, this balance uh, back, in, back in line. And so here's just some you know, examples of, um, of, of what, I, what I was saying. In fact, in the, in the case of Macy's Inc., the, uh, the Blue Mercury is growing like a weed. It's growing fantastically uh, well. It's now doubled the number of stores there, but there's so many other uh, as well. And when I say grow and shrink, that also includes online. Uh, as, as well, because there's a, there's a proliferation still of companies that are se selling online that won't be there for the long period of time unless, like what happened in 2000, they can prove their business model to actually uh, make money uh, in, in, over the long period of, t uh, of time and satisfy a consumer need. So, um, listen, closing stores is never easy. I, you know, people, when students ask me what are the you know, hardest things that, that I had to deal with as being uh, a, a CEO, this, is, this was clearly at the you know, top of the list. Uh, closing stores is, uh, is never easy. Um, and uh, every time you know, I did that during my, my tenure, the only way that I could actually justify it was that, but by looking at the map of the United States, seeing where the growth was, meaning population growth, and not just pure numbers where they live, um, because if a lot of people my age are all moving to a certain corner of Florida, uh, that doesn't mean I want to put another store there, because they're not necessarily going to be shopping for new, new, new clothing or new furniture or, or, or new homeware products or accessories or cosmetics. And so you have to look at demographics as well. Um, but when we did that, and we realized that there was a lot of places where we had stores that in fact the population was simply shrinking or it was aging. Uh, it just didn't make sense for the next five years to have a store there, even though every one of those stores was cash flow positive. And I know a lot of retailers are going through this now. Very, very difficult to say to yourself, you mean you really want me to close this store that makes money? It, already, it makes money. You, what you have to ask yourself, or at least what I felt I had asked myself, What's going to happen in five years? And if I don't get in front of this now, I'm going to be the last one standing, and I'm going to be standing, standing alone and have to react 
as opposed to getting in front of the, uh, of the challenge. And so this is something that I throw out, but I, you, know, you, do, you do recognize that when you, when you do make that decision, a lot of constituents here are, uh, are impacted by, uh, by your decision. And then another thing that I just want to point out is this, uh, this second to the last, uh, last line here, and that is, it's just the nature of the, of the media business. You know, I and mean, I, I hate to make this, uh, this analogy, but you know, you, there is such extraordinary reaction, and that was, we, there, was, there was two incredibly sad and, and, and difficult uh, cat catastrophic plane crashes by a Boeing uh, jet, and they were happened, two of them happened in the last month. Well, you'd never report that a thousand takeoffs and landings were successful with that same plane. You would just focus on those two. And by the way, I understand that, and it was very sad and it was very difficult. But there's no balance there. So when we, when we talk about stores, no one says that this company at Signet is keeping open 2,500 stores. They are all, the, the media will focus on, they're closing 150, they're closing 5% of their stores, or whatever the number, number is. And that's what we read, and that's what the consumer sees. So they, the consumer says, all I see is this negative thing happening about retail. I'm on the other end of this. I, I strongly believe that once this, this supply and demand gets back in line, there's going to be tremendous opportunity for, for those retailers who get through it to grow again, both in the physical stores as well as, as online. And as I said, there are certain retail uh, concepts that, that are growing. This was uh, the Rachel Schechtman uh, story that that uh, a story, uh, no pun intended, well actually it is a pun intended, uh, that, that who presented here, here last year, some new ideas, new concepts, beta electronics business is a new category uh, be, of, of, of contemporary electronics being brought into store, trying to create some new innovations, some new ideas, um, putting the, the off-price business inside of the physical store, and, uh, and I think that concept has worked extremely well. I know at Macy's, but wh why not? Why not, since, we're, since Macy's, stores like Macy's are competing with off-price, why not create their own off-price and put it inside the physical store? At first, I thought, man, that's going to be cannibalization to the main floor businesses. As it turns out, it is. It definitely does, does cannibalize the first, uh, the first couple of floors. But the top floor added on, ends up adding 700 basis points to total store performance on average, and so it's actually been a very successful uh, strategy and keeping more and more uh, consumers in the stores. And then when you layer on and, and add in uh, the, uh, the, off the, 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 the clearance merchandise next to it, you can create the critical mass and really create a, uh, a shopping uh, uh, atmosphere for the off-price consumer. And then new, constantly looking for new consumers. In this particular case, this is an off-the-mall uh, business, the Blue Mercury Cosmetics business, and so it's capturing uh, consumers that were shopping for beauty but not in a department store and not in a shopping mall, so it's adding new consumers that you can market to in other ways, particularly online. Uh, and then continue to invest, continue to invest in e-commerce and, and, and technology or other good ways to think about how you're able to uh, attract and retain these new uh, younger consumers. And then just, you know, the here's, here's the top 10 uh, retailers. Interesting, interesting to me is that only Amazon and QVC are uh, the only two on this list that are not, uh, did not start like a, as a physical uh, st uh, retail store. So eight out of 10 started as a, as a physical uh, retailer that have now jumped to the top of the list of, uh, uh, of uh, Online. So one of the things I have, have been able to do in the last uh, year or so uh, with my new found time for myself is to uh, interview with uh, a lot of uh, people who have become my friends in, in lots of different industries. And you see everybody from the CEO of Michael Kors, the CEO of MasterCard, the CEO of AT&T, uh, the CEO of Weight Watchers, uh, CEO of Chevron Oil, uh, the CEO of Mike Bloomberg. Uh, and go on and on and on, uh, CEO of, uh, of Turnin Entertainment, uh, Tommy Hilfiger, you know, it's, it's to meet all of these people and get their advice. And, and one of the things that uh, we've all, this is what we've all agreed on. What we've all agreed on in any category, in any business, um, if there's too much space devoted to it, you're going to fill up that space with inventory. And then you're going to have too much inventory. And when you have too much inventory, you're going to end up with an oversupply uh, versus the demand that you, you, that you have, as I've, I've described. Once that happens, 
The only way to get rid of that inventory is to reduce the price, right? Or you can send it back to the vendor if you want. But, uh, <laughs> but, but real, realistically, uh, you're going to reduce price. And um, once one reduces price, others are going to match that and reduce their price. What that brings is lower margins. And once that happens, not everybody's going to have the balance sheet that's going to allow them to get through those periods. So ultimately, you're going to have fewer retailers. The strong, as I said, balance sheet, strong, are going to survive. And back and over time, through this process, supply and demand will come back in alignment. We are in that process right now. We have been in that process for two and a half to three years. It's just, as I said, a more gradual era of disruption versus the major era disruptions that I talked about earlier uh, in, my, in my talk. That's what we're seeing today. And when the supply and demand is back in line, even though some retailers right now, such as Walmart, who's going to be speaking soon, Target, others, are doing very well right now, um, the entire spectrum of what's left of us at the end of the day will begin to rise uh, in, in, a, in a more consistent and broad-based uh, broad manner when supply and demand comes back in a line, when retail physical space is back in line, when inventory is back in line, uh, and, and when, when we, have, we have gone through this process that I've, I've described. That's when growth and earnings in more, more of a general way will take place. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the, the last... Uh, you know, if you, if you, if you noticed in my, in my comments, these disruptions happened every six or eight years. So um, the only thing that I want to caution us all about is that that slide I just described, we're going to get through this, and we're going to have a, a, a very good position in a, in a relatively short period of time, I believe, uh, for retailers to, to thrive in a more general way than they have. And as soon as that happens, others of us are going to say, wow, you know what? I think I can add more stores. I mean, I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing really well. And so keep an eye on that last, uh, that, that last slide because I believe it will repeat itself in about six to eight years. Thanks very much for listening. Come on, come on.